Hello guys and welcome to this video for us to discuss about this case here and uh, of course we need to diagnose this radiograph but it depends on the clinical situation right so we are going to assume different clinical situations here for us to you know just to work with this case as, as an exercise okay uh, but before that let's talk about the technique of this radiograph okay so is this radiograph taken correctly so that's the first question here and actually the answer is not so much so it's it's, uh, it's correct partially why because the angle is too high all right so if the angle is too high for the radiograph we in shorten the teeth okay and that's actually what's happening here so that's why we are seeing uh, too much uh, height superior to the canine okay so all this area here we are seeing the canine is a little bit in shortened so this is because the angle is actually too high for the upper right quadrant which is the one we have here right so this is a radiograph of k9 and lateral incisors so those two teeth were supposed to be centralized in the image and that's actually what's happening okay uh, let's now analyze what we have here so we have the level of the ovular crest here okay and then we have the uh, nasal floor right so just for us to comment a little bit of uh, anatomy <clears throat> but then we need to diagnose these three uh, teeth that we have here right well uh, what what's happening here so let's start by the center incisor the one one so we have here uh, the, those two restorations okay so a distal restoration and the mesial restoration which is also uh, palatal as well and then are they good all right so of course you guys are seeing that the um, adaptation let's say of this restoration is not ideal but we are seeing uh, 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 of course a radiolucent line but it's not carious okay so let's analyze this so we have this uh, radiolucent image here between the restoration and the dentin but sometimes when we put too much uh, bones and primer materials for example then we end up with these lines okay so it depends a little bit on the um, on the clinical procedure then we have uh, even this radiolucent image here okay so the, i'm talking about the very thin line between the restoration and the dentin okay and again this uh, could be just the thickness of the liner or material or the bond or, or primer okay but then we have this uh, situation here and that's lack of adaptation of the restoration so maybe you know the matrix was not used properly or something but uh, well, you could follow up if you want depend of of course on the clinical situation as well okay we are going to comment about some possibilities uh, in regarding the periapical region then i hope you guys realize that we have periodontal ligament space widening okay so periodontal ligament space widening is happening uh, probably because we have these restorations the poop chamber is at atrophic as well but then we need to understand uh, if we were going to you know what's the treatment plan so let's also analyze the levels of the alveolar crest right so that's the level of the bone and that's the level that we have of the bone here sometimes you see two different lines because we have buccal plate and palatal plate but uh, of course the level is usually not so different from each other so we need to analyze the height of the alveolar bone here and that's actually the marginal bone height so the marginal bone level it's actually in the middle third of this route okay so you know we we need to consider this in our decision then we have this situation of the lateral incisor okay so you guys are seeing that we have uh, of course lack of a restoration here a crown uh, even the poop chamber is exposed there's no root canal treatment but then you want to treat the root canal uh, you you are seeing of course that um, we have a peri periapical radiolucency so this is periapical well periodontal ligament space widening but now th this is too much so it's the beginning of a periapical granuloma but also with uh, external root resorption okay now look at the dimensions of this root and the level of the bone okay 
So even if you achieve a good uh, endodontic treatment and then a post, okay, take a look at the dimensions of these roots and you want to place a post here for them uh, to place a crown. Okay, so what is the predictability of this tooth? So of course, I hope you guys realized, especially the ones in the beginning of the dental course, that um, this tooth is to be extracted. Okay, so that's um, maybe the most predictable treatment here, okay? Uh, you guys are seeing that I'm commenting on my decisions and there are different decisions accepted uh, in most of the cases, okay? So as long as we are uh, using uh, evidence-based approach, then we are fine, okay? So we should always check the articles, the books that we always refer here uh, in this uh, channel. Well, but that's the situation of the lateral incisor, okay? Now, the situation of the canine, well, that's the level of the bone, okay? Here in the distal aspect of these roots, the level of the bone, uh, we, so we have more marginal bone loss, right? At the middle third of the root, okay? So this would be a vertical bone defect on the mesial aspect. We have periodontal ligament space widening as well, okay? This image here, which is even suggestive of peri uh, periodontal ligament space widening and could be that uh, that we are having also uh, external root resorption a little bit, but again, uh, the, this radiograph is not the best one. Now we are seeing the this situation here below the restoration. Okay, so again, it's not the same radiolucency or radio opacity that we have on the rest of the dentin. Okay, if we if you compare with this radio opacity of the dentin, for example. You guys are seeing that we could uh, we could interpret this as a different radiolucent aspect of the dentin, but then again, uh, radiographs are only to be taken after the clinical examination, okay, and the patient's history as well. So now, what is the uh, chief complaint of the patient? All right, and that's the second key point of today. So we have the patient's history, we have the chief complaint. Where's the pain of this patient? The patient should be complaining about biting as well. Okay, so there's no posterior teeth here. And then posterior teeth should protect anterior teeth. And then instead of restoring first the anteriors, we should, of course, treat periodontal disease, extractions, then the posterior here, rehabilitation, the prosthetic rehabilitation, and then we could do the anterior restorations. Okay, so we are just talking about possibilities here. Now, um, uh, let, let's assume that the patient doesn't have any other teeth, for example. Then can we keep those teeth maybe to make a partial removable denture? Well, of course, we, uh, the lateral you need to extract. The other two, if the patient is uh, elderly patient, so uh, with an advanced age, and then depending on the conditions of this patient, you want to avoid extractions at all costs. The periodontal conditions were stable, so you managed to do a very nice periodontal treatment and maybe, you know, uh, replace the wrong restorations and everything. And then because of the age of the patient, you try to keep the canine, and, uh, you know, e even the central incisor. But ideally, of course, you know, imagine that um, the, probably this, even the clinical situation, the static uh, Situation of the gingival tissue is not the best one. We have this bone loss already happening here, and then you should, you know, probably treat this patient with a more complex prosthetic approach. Okay, so if there is no other teeth, probably if, if this is a young patient, what is the predictability of keeping these teeth? Okay, so probably you could go for a full arch implant um, supported fixed bridge, for example. Uh, you know, this this is. This would be acceptable because depending on the gingival levels, for example, it's very hard to keep the aesthetics of the patients uh, when we have gingival recession and bone loss like this. Okay, but then with a, you know, a, a implant supported bridge, then there are other possibilities. Okay, if there is no other teeth, of course. So we're just talking about possibilities here. Okay, uh, then let's see the third key point here, which is of course to consider all these possibilities for the treatment planning, okay? So again, it's not the best situation here. Uh, you have the bone level in the middle third of the, of the canine, 
even the, the central incisor, okay, atrophic pulp chambers. Uh, but again, uh, you should always take into consideration the age of the patient and, and you know, the, the type of antagonist, okay. Now I'm going to, to treat the root canal, place a crown or, or make this an abutment for a bridge or make this, a, you know, a, the support of a removable prosthesis. But then what is the antagonist arch? Okay, so if the antagonist arch is a, a acrylic, for example, a removable denture, then the prognosis is different uh, if, uh, as compared to a natural teeth or as compared to antagonist zirconia, right? So don't forget to consider all these things. So just for you guys to see how the treatment planning is usually complex. Okay, but here we are just diagnosing this radiograph. Those would be the main alterations, okay? Even for a dental implant, let's say the patient wants a dental implant, you could imagine that you have height and off for a dental implant, but then take a look, we need an abutment, and then the crown, you know, imagine the height of this crown. So this height here would be already very long, then we need a very long implant as well, okay? If that's the only issue of the patient, right? But then to plan the implants, of course, you guys, uh, I hope you guys know by now that we need a CBCT because the, uh, even uh, we have the con concavity of the palatal bone and you guys want to ask.